the Gisborne area, the waters are receding after the recent disastrous floods, leaving in their wake a trail of devastation and damage to property. Evidence of the severe losses suffered in the district are the carcasses of 6,000 sheep which were trapped and drowned by the floodwaters. At the Kaiti freezing works, mud is hosed off by emergency water supply provided by the fire brigade before the fleeces are salvaged. Relief work is quickly organized in the district and food and clothing collected for those affected. Everybody who can be spared is taking part in the big job of getting things back to normal. In the grey dawn, about a fortnight later at Palmerston North, almost 300 miles away, nearly 40 members of Manawatu and Wanganui Young Farmers Clubs assemble to be taken to the area by army transport. They'll be joined by Young Farmers Club members from Wairarapa and Hawke's Bay, bringing the number of the party up to 50, all of whom are voluntarily giving two weeks of their own time to give practical help to the farmers of the Gisborne district. Their main job will be rebuilding fences and cleaning up ravaged farmland. They're showing that they fully appreciate the responsibilities of one community to another in a time of crisis. This bolt of cloth contains 65 yards of material and from it will come 20 ready-made men's suits. Tailoring of individual suits is by no means a forgotten profession but most suits that are worn these days are mass-produced. A master pattern is marked out on a piece of cloth three and a half yards long. The job is done carefully by a first-class tailor, and as the pattern is marked, the layers of cloth are spread out. The pattern is laid on the top of 20 thicknesses of material and the cutting machines go to work. The job seems simple enough, but it requires a high degree of skill and concentration to make cuts that are absolutely accurate. Pieces are cut and ready for the machine room. 24 pieces of cloth will have to be sewn together before the suit is completed. Most of the machining is done by girls. They're quick and nimble fingered. Work is done on the assembly line principle. Each worker performs one operation, whether it's sewing the coat, pockets, waistcoat, or putting on buttons. This button machine would be a minor blessing to any housewife. Thorough steam pressing and the suit will be ready for the customer. From the time the pattern was marked, nearly a hundred people helped to make it. Although every clothing factory is producing to capacity, most of us wonder why we can't buy a good suit as easily and cheaply as before the war. The managing director of this factory, Mr. Matheson, gives some reasons why suits cost more and are harder to get. Well, I feel that the clothing workers and manufacturers in New Zealand have done an excellent job in that prices have not gone higher. Raw materials imported from the United Kingdom, such as cloth made from wool, and trimmings made chiefly from cotton have risen by about three to four times pre-war 
yet suits made locally are not more than about double. Even if we had more labour, we could not have gone much faster because materials are still very short, particularly worsted suitings. <laughs> In a workshop he built above a house that he also built at Island Bay, Wellington, the complete clockmaker is busy building a clock. Each part of every clock is cut and finished by hand. Whether a clock runs smoothly and truly depends largely on the cutting of the gear wheels, an operation demanding considerable mathematical calculation and skill in execution. Pivots are turned in this homemade clock lathe. At the bench, the newly made parts are added to the partially assembled mechanism and the striking and chiming action is given a run over to test for accuracy. The workshop regulator sets time for all activities and with the mechanism assembled, finishing touches are made to the case. figures are arranged in place on the dial of a grandfather clock. A movement of his own design is the Bender patent escapement, a tower or master clock capable of driving many slave clocks by remote control. Whilst Mr. Bender is busy designing and making clocks upstairs, his wife shows off some of the many and varied types he's made. This one needs winding only once in 400 days a French carriage clock with a glass-sided case. And this intricate looking job is a copy of an English skeleton clock. A master electric clock that's been running for three years on the same dry cell battery will also drive a number of slave clocks. A Dutch mathematician named Hip invented the original of this one nearly a hundred years ago. This Westminster chiming grandfather, which indicates the day, the month, and the phases of the moon, indicates also the craftsmanship and skill of the complete clockmaker. Weather conditions couldn't have been worse when the Canterbury and Wellington teams took the field to play the final for the English Football Association trophy on the Basin Reserve Wellington this King's birthday. In spite of bitterly cold weather and driving rain, a crowd of about three and a half thousand hardy citizens turned out to see the game. Canterbury kicked off, but Wellington, making good use of the wind, and with their forwards working hard, had the southern defence on their toes. McKinley opened the score for the local 11 after about 15 minutes play. Wellington's triumph was short-lived, however. Fisher in goal, his view restricted by the local backs, was unable to see the ball when McClellan took a free kick from well out. They continued at this pace, but Wellington were unable to draw ahead, and at half-time, the score was Wellington 3, Canterbury 2. With the changeover, it was Canterbury's turn to play the win, and the equaliser came when the ball deflected off a Wellington player into the net. Wellington, who had settled down against the wind, were playing better football than in the first half, and were rewarded by their fourth goal. Canterbury fought back hard, and Dowker, using his speed, made no mistake with a hard drive past Fisher. With four minutes to go, Canterbury gold once more and had no difficulty in holding their lead of five goals to four. Mr Nash, patron of New Zealand Association football, presented the trophy to Merv Gordon, captain of the victorious Canterbury side, and congratulated the four provincial teams competing in the tournament on the fine standard of football attained.